Okay, well, greetings to everyone. Um, okay, well, let's get started. Um, greetings to everyone. Welcome to the October installment of the Science Communication Lunch and Learn. This is a monthly series which is sponsored by Duke University's Initiative for Science and Society. In this series, we explore unique thought-provoking ways that science is communicated to the public, and we have a really outstanding example of that today. To those of you who've attended SciComm Lunch and Learn events in the past, welcome back. We're glad to have you back. And to those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome, and we hope that you will become regulars in this monthly series. I'm Jory Weintraub, and I'm a faculty member at Duke University and the Science Communication Director with the Duke Initiative for Science and Society. And I will be moderating your uh, session today. I was hoping we would be joined today by my colleague, Dr. Ariana Ely, who used to work with me here at Duke running this series um, before she moved on to a different position at another institution. Um, today's session, which is gonna be a really wonderful session, is one that she set up before she moved on to the other institution. Um, and, and we were hoping she'd be able to come back and moderate, but unfortunately her obligations with her new position prevent her from being here. So I will do my best to fill in for Ariana on moderating today's session. One of Ariana's areas of scholarship is an area known as STEAM, which is the interface of STEM or science, technology, engineering, and math with the arts. Ariana is one of the creators of an annual STEAM exhibit called Art of a Scientist, which pairs a scientist with an artist to explore creative ways to communicate STEM through the arts. I encourage you all to check out the Art of a Scientist website, and I believe we're gonna put a link to that in the chat room so you can check that out. And if you're an artist or a scientist, or for that matter, both, uh, consider participating in future versions of Art of a Scientist. So today's presenters, uh, Dr. Aaron McKenney and Jude Cassidy, are collaborators on STEAM projects that are so innovative, creative, and fascinating that we thought it would be great to bring them here to SciComm Lunch and Learn to share their collaborations with you. Quick introduction to our today's panelists. Dr. Aaron Kenny studies how microbial communities form over time and how they adapt to their environments. Aaron received her PhD in biology from Duke University and is currently an assistant professor and director of undergraduate programs at NC State University's Department of Applied Ecology. Jude Cassidy is a soundscape artist and electronic musician from Durham, North Carolina. Her work ranges from sound experimentation to more structured compositions for dance, film, art events, and yoga. Jude has an MA in speech communication, theater, and performance studies from Eastern Michigan University. So today, Aaron and Jude are gonna take you uh, through a presentation and a demonstration of their collaborative work. And there should be plenty of time at the end for questions. So I want to encourage all of you to um, use the chat box, put your questions in the chat, and we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can uh, before the hour is up. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to today's presenters, Aaron and Jude, to help us understand how we can listen to our guts. Thanks so much for that awesome introduction, Jory. Uh, it's really great to be here. And yeah, I. Also, it's really too bad that Ariana couldn't join us in firsthand, but I'm so glad that she recruited uh, Jude and I to give this talk. So thanks everybody for joining and, and thank you for hosting this event. Um, Jude, do you want to unmute and say a few things? And as I start- I think, I, am I unmuted now? You're perfect. I think I did. Oh, great. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am calling in because of uh, internet problems, so um, hopefully this will all work out really well. Um, I know the presentation, so um, I think we're going to be just fine with that, but I'm just calling in on this. And let's see, hopefully everybody should be seeing my shared screen at this point. Yep, you're good. Perfect. All right. So um, as Jory laid out, we'll be talking about listen to your gut, engaging the public with science and sound. Um, so I guess uh, I'm a visual learner. So getting to work with Jude has been a huge broadening of my horizons to this entire other sensory uh, engagement. Um, 
I enjoy a lot of podcasts, but I hadn't personally tried to communicate uh, my findings or science via sound before, aside from obviously narratives during talks. Um, so here's a snapshot um, from our third sourdough summit as part of the global sourdough project. And this is when um, I and my other collaborators on the sourdough project, uh, Liz Landis, uh, Angela, Oliverio and Laura Nichols. Um, we actually met with Jude in the mountains uh, and with another artist named Fern pictured here uh, to talk through everything that we had found from our global sourdough science project so far and then how we could begin to translate our findings from science to different art forms for public engagement. Um, so that's kind of the context. This is uh, the amazing common room of this lodge where we were all staying at the Art and Science in the Field Center um, run by Nancy Lowe out near Penland in the mountains. So just a tremendous uh, resource and space uh, for collaboration. Um, so I'm just going to launch in with, you know, as kind of a starter practice uh, set of data, right? Jude was really excited to work with us collaboratively on the sourdough project. Um, then she wanted to kind of test the waters, uh, figuring out how to translate complex uh, microbial uh, sequencing data sets into sound, right? So to give her a starter set, I gave her my dissertation data uh, from lemur gut microbiome. So here you can see this is actually um, a painting made by a lemur walking through paint on his way to a crazen. And then I drew up uh, pen and ink drawings for my committee members uh, when I defended my dissertation. So just to kind of steep you in the context of lemur gut microbiomes. So a brief um, scientific overview of that system. I've spent over a decade thinking about how complex microbial communities form in the guts of humans and non-human primates and some rogue carnivores. So uh, here you can see at the top, uh, this um, phylogenetic or evolutionary family tree. So you can get an idea of how all of these different animals that I've studied over the years are related to each other. You can see lemurs are a uh, closely knit group of primates that are more distantly related from other primates, uh, including great apes, chimpanzees, obviously humans. Um, and then my rogue carnivores are on the left. The carnivores tend to have a very short GI tract because they evolved to consume a high protein and fat diet, so they don't really depend on a microbiome. These are rogue carnivores because they eat mostly fruits or bamboo, so you know, not your typical carnivorous diet. Um, whereas uh, your omnivores and your leaf-eating primates they depend on gut microbes to digest the fiber in their diets for them. So if you're leaning heavily on 100 trillion bacteria in your colon to digest your food for you, you then have to evolve a much more complex gut to house those microbes. So you have your, you know, your, your superhero sidekicks throughout your life, but also to give your food the time to be digested fully. So out of all of these different animals, um, the data set that I shared with Jude was actually focused on three species of lemurs. So from left to right here, you have the ring-tailed lemur, the red ruffed lemur, and um, the cockerel shafak, a leaf-eating lemur. So we have two different diets and three different GI tracts that were evolved to eat those diets. So the main takeaway here is the more sugar or the more fruit you eat, the simpler GI tract that species would tend to have. The more fiber you consume, the more complex GI tract. And for this project, um, I was comparing how these complex microbial communities formed in the gut from birth of different lemur babies until they were fully weaned. Um, and this is super glamorous work, right? We don't want to go uh, cutting open animals to get to their guts. Uh, we don't want to perform unnecessary surgeries on endangered animals, even in captivity where we might have that sort of control or opportunity. So instead, it's a very glamorous fecal collection. Um, so I spent a lot of time watching for stiff tails for these animals to offer their samples for me. From those samples, I extracted DNA and I sequenced one specific gene region. It's kind of like taking the fingerprint or the last name of a microbiome um, to find out the identities of all the bacteria living in the guts of these lemurs. So it's almost analogous to reading the last names in a phone book of a community. So then I could get those community profiles. And the first thing that I found was, you know, 
thousands of different species. Uh, that's far too complex for human eyes or human brains to deal with. And if we're thinking about building a soundscape from data, then too much noise, right? So the first thing I did was to narrow it down to higher classification levels at the phylum level. So a, a broader um, taxonomic classification. So here you can see I only had, you know, I was able to narrow it down to like 10 or 13 different phyla. Still, that's a pretty complex table of data, right? So for each of three different species, I have all my uh, six different time points uh, for the babies and compared to the mothers when they were giving birth. If I, as a visual thinker, try to visualize that data, um, I might come up with a bar chart like this, which makes a beautiful mosaic or a rug, right? Um, but we can't even start to tease apart what these different relationships are until we um, perform statistical tests to identify. It looks like lemurs at birth have a lot of that light pink, that proto proteobacteria. It looks like they have a lot more uh, proteobacteria at birth than at subsequent life stages, but is it statistically significant? So to do that, we would have to run a lot of mathematical analyses just to tease apart and make sense of these data sets, even as I'm trying to visualize them to make much more sense out of these data than just looking at numbers in a table. So I, again, I was really excited to find out you know, how Jude might um, transform the, these data uh, instead of a picture to give us a soundscape. So Jude, you want to tell us how so you're you on, You're on slide nine right now? I am. Okay, cool. We can hang there for a sec. Um, I want to talk a little bit at first about data sonification in general because um, it's a pretty big uh, area of interest. There's an international organization that um, is uh, that is an interested in uh, sonifying data. I first became interested in it um, attending MoogFest here in Durham. Uh, there was a lot of various kinds of data sonification going on from just streaming data through a sounding program to um, I was able to attend a uh, workshop with Mark Ballora from Penn State, who I just found out a couple days ago actually passed away a little over a year ago, um, he was an amazing. He was an amazing uh, person. Um, he used Super Collider, which is a program, a computer program to program the soundscapes of tidal changes and hurricanes. Um, and there's also an, a pretty well-known astrophysicist who is blind, Wanda Diaz Merced, who uses sound to explore the space physics data. And some of her cited colleagues even use um, the programs that she used because they can hear some things that they can't necessarily see they've discovered. Um, so my interest boiled down to exploring, because I'm a musician and a soundscape artist, um, I'm coming at this as a sculptor of sound. Um, I'm interested in creating sonic illustrations. Um, so I was really working from thinking about things like uh, the the uh, equal tempered scale spectrum, just the normal thing we hear in music. And can, was there a way for me to just use that kind of uh, uh, approach to sonifying the data that I'm encountering? So um, Aaron's data was a perfect first for my first attempt at this because it was enough to be intimidating and challenging but not overwhelming to the process. So in order to get this into a manageable um, framework, I decided to focus on uh, one uh, mother and who had triplets. I thought, well, good, we'll have three biomes that we can kind of hear in relation to each other that came from the same mother. Um, their collective microbiomes housed about, I think, 15 phylum. So that was enough for me to be able to assign a pitch note to each um, each uh, phylum name. So let's go ahead to that next slide, Aaron. Done. Okay. So this shows you, this is for one of the babies, Titan, and you can kind of see where, what I did. We've got the microbial phylum on the left column, and then I spread the notes that indicate the presence of each phyla um, over five uh, octaves 
from a G in the first octave up to a G in the third octave, just thinking about a piano. Um, and this was this allowed me to give each of the phylum a, a, a sense of presence. So if, they, if the phylum was there at that particular sampling point, it sounded. If it isn't, it doesn't sound. Um, and the other thing that I did too was I the five most because I had to go uh, I had too many phylum to assign to the number of notes I had. I also gave the the top five phylum all worked on G, so it ended the, it, it lends this kind of consonance to the whole thing. The ones that were the most predominant are coming in on different uh, pitches of G, but uh, on that same note. The rest of them were assigned a consonant, dis a consonant or dissonant note based on that G. So, Erin, if you can go to the next slide. Yep. Okay, so this shows you then, so that was to give you um, presence. This slide is showing you how I uh, was able to show abundance. So, um, hold on a second here. So, uh, for example, you'll see um, what what I did here was was to assign each one to a velocity range. So this was the abundance or the amount of uh, each protobacteria, I mean each uh, bacterial uh, phylum that was in there was assigned uh, a certain, so it comes across as either louder or softer based on the velocity ranges. Um, so the things to listen for, well, we're going to get ready to hear the linear, baby linear gut microbiome song. Uh, some things that you'll hear in this is that you'll hear, uh, Aaron mentioned that the protobacteria, proteobacteria was very prevalent at birth, and you'll hear that ring out in the first segment of it. Uh, what you're going to hear is at each stage of the um, uh, of the sampling process, you hear uh, you'll, you'll hear it iterated four times, and then uh, you'll hear the next one and the next one and the next one. So, you let you listen to it four times. The first time you're going to hear the very loud uh, proto proteobacteria, and then um, you will hear uh, uh, how one of the things that happens is that. Um, their microbiomes expanded in the number of the bacteria that were present um, and and they go it gets really wild and then at the end when they get to, to the wean they're actually able to um, uh, uh, it, it sort of falls into consonance with the mothers and you're going to hear the mothers in the background it's kind of a her her biome her microbiome was sampled when they were born and so hers, this is Aaron's idea, which I thought was really great. Her microbiome kind of plays underneath as a long cord, and you hear each of the uh, the, the the microbial uh, that, that that she had in her gut will sound through the whole thing. So, Aaron, you want to go ahead and play the piece? Yeah, here it comes. Okay. You heard, heard at the end there was I just sort of riffed through all of the various notes that were representing the various uh, biome bacteria. Um, so 
one of the things that I got excited about was that when I first looked at the data, I hadn't realized until I listened to this that there was actually the 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 uh, a number of bacteria didn't increase at each stage. It actually, at least with this group, it uh, it was at a place at birth. It increased when they started nursing, and then when solid foods were introduced, it decreased a little bit. And then it started increasing, increasing, increasing through the next three stages. And finally, at wean, it kind of comes into consonance with the mother's uh, biome. So I hadn't noticed that when I looked at the data, but I heard it when I listened to it. So that was kind of a fun thing. It was like, okay, this is what I was wondering. Can I hear something that I might not have noticed? And it happened for me at any rate. So, um, yeah, this was a very exciting beginning for me. I know when I shared this with... Uh, um, with Mark at Penn State, when I have a, had some interaction with him, he was like, well, it's not all the time that you get this data that makes a nice little tune like this. And so I felt like I was very lucky to get to do this particular uh, uh, kind of data and uh, to, show, to show it in this kind of way. That song never fails to make me smile and give me chills. I know, me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not often that you hear like years of work translated into a song of your labors. I mean, just incredible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so shall we tra transition to our second kind of case study? Yeah. With them? Awesome. So let's see, that was all prep work, right? Hard to believe that could have been like the climax and, and the accumulation of, of the project in itself. But that was in fact all prep work uh, for Jude to actually work with our sourdough microbial community data, right? Um, so just as a bit of background, like why do we care about sourdough? Humans have been baking bread for, we now know, for over 14,000 years. We used to think, oh, 10,000 years because ancient Egyptians like drew us pictures of their process. But it's been for 14,000 years, even before humans were growing wheat or grains. We were foraging grains and fermenting them to bake bread. So just a Microbial cultures really lie at the heart of human cultures across the globe and across time. Um, and it's not just yeast in these um, sourdough starter cultures, right? It's a, a relatively simple community for sure compared to guts, but you've got yeast, you've got lactic acid bacteria, which are any number of bacteria belonging to a specific class that can all produce lactic acid, uh, and acetic acid bacteria, which are present at lower quantities, but may actually have a, a pretty tremendous impact on, on different aromas or flavors that we might um, I identify in breads. And these microbes not only help to leaven our bread, but they also increase shelf life, they increase the nutritional value of the bread. Um, and, and they also, by producing those acids, they're keeping a lot of other microorganisms from growing in your starter that we might not otherwise want growing in our food, right? Think think mold producers, think pathogens. Those creatures are not typically um, acid tolerant, right? So we were really curious. Nobody had really uh, studied the diversity of microorganisms that grow in a sourdough starter before. So uh, to do this, we actually created a citizen science project, the Global Sourdough Project. Um, and we were able to collect 571 sourdough starters uh, from folks living in 17 countries across the world. So you can see there was still a bit of a, a Western world bias in this map, but just a tremendous data set uh, to be able to try to cast a very wide net, just asking folks who have sourdough starters at home, what age it is, what flour they feed it, how often they feed it, do they keep it in the fridge or on the counter, how often do they bake with it, all sorts of different questions about the humans and their management techniques even what style of home did they live in? Um, and do they have pets, right? To try and figure out what microbes live in starters all over the world and what different factors might actually shape those microbial communities. So we use DNA sequencing, right? Um, here, since uh, in the previous data set with the lemurs, uh, there were something like 58 samples in those bar charts that I showed you before. Here, just for scale, this line represents one sample on the bar charts that I'll be showing you, right? So when we sequenced those 571 samples, we found that yeasts in sourdough starters all over the world are overwhelmingly Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So that's the same species 
as in baker's yeast that you might buy in dried form in a packet or in one of those squat little brown jars at the store. Right, so overwhelmingly we're seeing not only do most starters in our global data set have Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but where it occurs, it tends to be highly dominant, right? We saw similar dominant patterns in the bacteria uh, communities. So here you see also blocks of color, right? The, the red bacteria, the pink bacteria, you also see blocks of yellow and light blue throughout. Right? So what we see here is that these starters, no matter where they're grown, no matter by whom, no matter how old they are or what they're fed, they tend to be dominated by a few types of yeast or bacteria, and those microbes are different. So those dominant characters lend a different personality to the starter. Right? Um, so the data set that uh, we shared with Jude was, again, simplified. Right? We decided instead of giving all this 571 starters, all the community uh, structures, we instead focused on the five most dominant types of yeast. So here you can see um, growth curves. When we grew the, those five types of yeast in the presence of plenty of food, you can see this, these are the patterns of growth that they all show over a period of 48 hours. And here we're, we're measuring the number of yeast cells as a measure of like how quickly they're dividing. Right. And here you can see that Saccharomyces cerevisiae grows really fast. So it not only uh, occurs in most of our starters at high levels, but it also is just a very fast growth. So now I'll turn it back over to you, Jude. So let's see, we're on, um, let's slide go ahead to slide 21. Yep. Okay. So um, when I was looking over the data from this project, this particular graph just jumped out at me because it sort of looked like, reminded me of waveforms, partial waveforms or something, sound waveforms. So I was like, well, let me look at this. It's, it's the changes that are happening over time, which is important in terms of sonification. Uh, that's something that, that's what we want to show is this sort of movement and change. And in this case, I'm still using notes, uh, but not necessarily, the, before the, the, the notes were representing the different kinds of, of microbiome bacteria. In this case, um, I really wanted to sound out the growth. I wanted to hear the growth patterns between them. And so rather than stringing it out over five octaves, I collapsed it down into two octaves and, and basically used a chromatic scale of just uh, where on the piano, you just play from one note to up to the white key to the black key to the next white key to the next black key and keep going up for two octaves. And so because I wanted to, uh, give, to give the sense of that growth. So the two that I did, and Aaron, you're going to have to help me here because I have my, I don't have the names here, but I know uh, the one of the, you're going to hear two voices, two, two of these yeasts growing t at the same time. One of them was the pink line, which That's is which one? Wicker hamomyces anomalous. Okay, that's the W anomalous, okay. And then I also did the neon green line that's kind of in the middle, and then um, which one was that one? Let's see, the one in the middle is Namavazima castellian. Okay. So we're, we're looking at those two in particular. And so as you're listening to this, what you'll hear is if you look from, uh, the, from, from the start to the first 12 hours, you'll see that the, uh, the, the neon green really grows fast. It goes up to right below 0.6, whereas the, the uh, uh, W anomalous that only goes up to below 0.3. So you'll hear one of the voices really moving, da 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 da, -da up. The other one's more slow, but then you hit that 12 hour mark and then they switch places. The, the pink really grows and the, uh, the other one does not. Um, it, it sort of levels off. And then when the, the last uh, two series of, of 12 hours, uh, they're, they're, the interplay is not as, uh, you can't tell the difference as much, but you can really hear it in the first two. And I did these as, as string voices um, I guess it was, it, it was coming from my bias of I make com kombucha and the yeast in kombucha is stringy. So I went, oh, strings of yeast. Well, let's use strings for it. It, it probably wasn't exactly appropriate for sourdough, but um, I think it did work. So uh, let's go ahead and play that one. 
Erin. Right. Here we go. I don't know how distorted that was very distorted for me because I'm listening over the phone. I'm hoping it wasn't as distorted for you. It was a little hard to hear. Um, but I do, I, you know, uh, uh, I would invite people to uh, go to my blog at dejacuse.blog and you can um, read more in depth of this process and hear that a little bit more clearly. I mean, hopefully it came across fairly well, but you could, you could really hear the differences in those two growth patterns. As it turned out, this data set was not as important in the final analysis of the paper, but these particular sonic profiles of the yeast might, are going to give me a starting point for sonifying. What I'm interested in sonifying is the positive and negative co-occurrences of these yeasts and bacteria um, through the whole uh, fermentation process. So I'm still kind of uh, working with that one. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging. Uh, because really what I'm wanting to do is to sonify interactions. And so uh, at least this particular, uh, the, the profile that I've outlined with the, the, this graph will give me a certain sense of the personalities of each of these yeasts. And then uh, looking into uh, sonifying really how they work together or against each other, to, uh, use it, metabolizing carb, carbohydrates and amino acids and producing carbon dioxide. There's a lot of complex things going on. But I'm hoping, I've been studying some um, modular synthesis, working with modular synthesis, and um, I'm hoping to use uh, a lot of uh, effects and um, different types of things to give a sense of the changes uh, so that one of these voices might come through and then it could be modulated by some kind of an effect that would be the lactic acid working with it. Um, so there's a lot of potential, a lot of, of direction to go with this, and I'm still kind of just getting started with it. Also, I did want to say one thing. There's a picture of me. I think our final picture is of me at the uh, um, our meeting in the mountains. And one of my ideas for this had been I work with a piece of music called In C, I-N capital C, by Terry Riley. And it's a series of modules that get played together and they and they're it's in the key of C but it modulates through a number of different keys while these different little um, blocks of, of sound play over each other so I was I was thinking about maybe using that as a possible uh, a, a, a putting one of one of the things from NC as a marker for each one of these and how they interplay I'm not going to use NC itself but I'm going to do something like that to uh, come up with the song of the sourdough eventually. I think that was the perfect segue to play us out, as it were. Um, yeah, sure. and as, as a fellow lover of NC, I'm really excited for that conceptual framework. Cool. So, Jory, do you, shall we open up for Q&A at this point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I thought you were going to play one more piece. Sorry. Oh. Um, yeah, no, I think that would be great. I mean, this this was so cool. I couldn't even stop myself from typing how cool it was in the chat because it was just as a a scientist and a very amateur musician. I just love the interface of these two. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we do have uh, several questions that were submitted in advance, and I'd also like to encourage anybody who's listening now who has questions to type them in the chat box. Um, and I am going to exercise moderator privilege and ask my own question first, if that's okay. Yeah, do you um, want me to stop sharing the screen or? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be great. And then we could, you know, if people wanna, I don't know if, if we've enabled video, pe um, people to turn on videos or not, but if people wanna share their face, if they can, that'd be great. But um, 
I will toss out the question to the two of you, and uh, you can you can both tell me what your response is. Um, so one of the things I do at Duke is I teach science communication courses for undergrads and grad students. And I always talk to my students about how every discipline, every profession has its own language. Um, and part of learning to communicate effectively is learning how to speak across languages. And so I'm wondering, um, when you first started collaborating, the two of you, to what extent did you feel like you spoke different languages, the languages of science and art? And, and if you did feel that way, how did you learn to become bilingual, essentially, so that you could have effective communications across these languages? That's a fabulous first question. Um, I'm yeah. very grateful that I had an opportunity to meet with Nancy Lowe even before meeting Jude, because one of Nancy's like passions and a long-term project of hers is, is the idea of this uh, parallel languages and trying to figure out how to translate languages between artists and scientists. Um, so she had already opened up my thoughts to, you know, how, how are we gonna communicate? Even um, I think in visual art, right? Scientists and visual artists both use the word model and we meet completely different things. Um, and yeah, so Jude, do you wanna speak to that? I think we definitely have a learning curve, but. <laughs> well, I was very appreciative of your patience with my questions in the beginning about, you know, how to uh, cut, how, how to get the data into a manageable format um, and learning that like t t cutting off at 0 0.01 saying anything that was less than 0.01 I'm not going to look at was an okay thing to do so I was like oh good good I'm not like just eliminating a bunch of stuff that was important so I appreciated your patience with my questions and the other thing was when I met with uh, the whole team out in the mountains was is I was like going these people are all artists they're artists and they're scientists and so it didn't feel, it really didn't feel that foreign in a lot of ways. It was sort of like they, you all, you all are thinking artistically. And I think it really, it, it seems like that's important in science from what I see. So. Yeah, I think uh, following up, I really appreciated your questions because it really helped me with that lemur data set to refine how I communicate it, hopefully to streamline. And it was amazing. Um, it felt like a magical synergy at that point where you were suggesting is 0.1 okay for like relative abundance threshold. And I'm like, that's exactly what we do. And it's kind of arbitrary, but like, you know, it's based in some sort of a logical decision. So it was, it was right. awesome to see that that was upheld across disciplines. Um, yeah, and I think in general, having these conversations has been so helpful as a scientist, making sure that I can communicate findings effectively. Um, and just out of curiosity, as a follow-up, did, did either of you have pre- Previous experience with the other person's discipline. Aaron, do you have a music background or do you, have you studied science at all? I played flute and piccolo in high school and college, <laughs> but I know no theory. <laughs> I appreciate from afar. Great. How about you, Jude? Did you have a science background before you got into it? I have gotten interested in science as an older adult. And so I have taken like Coursera courses and things on. I'm particularly interested in neurobiology and biophysics, and and so I have taken some courses. But the whole the microbiome thing was was definitely new, but also sort of burgeoning because it was like I was become everybody's becoming aware of how important that is. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I have to say you both did a fantastic job of becoming bilingual because the products that you came <laughs> up with are, are wonderful. Um, so I'm going to read a question now that was submitted in chat, and this is um, from our friend Madhu Kadi at NC State. Madhu, I'm glad you could join us. Welcome. Um, and he asks, as someone who doesn't think in music, these audioizations, and then he asked if that's a word, um, which <laughs> I say it's a word. It sounds good to me. Sounds um, good. But, but he says, are these audioizations, um, he said they sounded wonderful. It sounds like a great way to communicate these kinds of data. I'm wondering if anyone from Hollywood has approached you about using this approach to develop soundtracks for science fiction movies, say those featuring infectious diseases where they show cultures of DNA or anything of that sort, um, or at least for science documentaries. And that's a great question, I, because especially that second piece, 
sounded very yeah. much like something from a suspense movie to me as well. Hitchcock's yeasts, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very intriguing. I, um, I, there's been nothing, I don't know anything in terms of like f soundtracks of films and that sort of thing, but um, there was a, uh, a sound artist from the UK who early on in the whole uh, COVID-19 thing actually he took they when they first dna sequenced it he took that and made it into a soundscape and then so, various people myself included sort of took parts of what he did and created other soundscapes out of it so we were you know kind of i guess playing around with that idea in that but it wasn't in in uh, response to any kind of a visual like a movie or i think before this question, Emadu, that sounds amazing. And if you know anybody, like Jude, I would love to work with you on something like that. <laughs> I'm open. Okay, cool. Um, that sounds I, great. I think uh, before that question with that specific idea for an application, the closest I'd come to was, uh, I think it was, a, it was a radio lab podcast about the vision of the mantis shrimp. And they actually work with a choir to sing the different notes as the different wavelengths that different organisms can see. And that was, I mean, I think that was a few years before meeting you, Jude, but at, at that mm -hmm. point, I just thought that is so cool and kind of tucked it away as, wouldn't that be nice if there was a way to, you know, sing out uh, lemur data or, or microbiome data. So Jude, you've made a dream come true. <laughs> Aw, <laughs> for me too. <laughs> Great, I'm gonna move on to another question that we had pre-submitted, I think this is a really cool question as well. So um, the question is as follows. The phrase um, gut feeling or a feeling in my gut connotes tapping intuitive knowledge, tapping into intuitive knowledge. Do particular microbial gut communities contribute to or are they correlated with emotional experiences or states of well-being? And might some of these communities support improved emotional identification? That's an awesome question. Um, Jude, if it's okay with you, I'll jump in with a, a yes, few please do. research synopses over the last, I don't know, maybe decade. Uh, it's been at, la at least over the last four to six years. Um, I've been seeing papers um, where they're testing, you know, probiotics and prebiotics, right? Those buzzwords, but um, also thinking about anyone who lacto ferments. I'm a huge lacto fermenter. Um, so if you're eating these live foods or consuming specific lineages of bacteria that are touted as beneficial, right? There were a lot of questions about, you know, well, if they're in and out, right? First, uh, we like, and I'll say we as including myself in the scientific community, but um, early on, we realized you, if a person eats yogurt every day, then we will see lactobacillus, that uh, yogurt, the acid producing bacteria in yogurt that makes it taste tangy uh, and is considered to be beneficial. We'll see lactobacillus in a person's feces. So presumably it's been through their gut every day that they're eating yogurt. But as soon as you stop eating yogurt, you stop seeing lactobacillus. So it's like, well, it's transient, you know, it's in and out. So how could it be doing much of anything good? But then there were um, some more controlled laboratory experiments um, in mice. So they had mice that they induced anxiety um, and they were actually able to see that they're, um, when they reduced, what was it? I don't remember the specific causal order of this, so bear with me, but um, they saw that anxiety was correlated to reduced diversity in the gut microbiome, but that that could wow. be kind of rescued by consumption of lactobacillus. So they were actually mm -hmm. able to show, you know, if you, if you consume and specific lineages of lactobacillus, um, so known probiotic bacteria, that it could improve the mood. Uh, it could alleviate some effects of um, anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, that's, that's wonderful. Um, Move on to another question we had. Um, did the research suggest intersections with the effects of sound in animal microbiome and therapeutic uses of sound in humans? I'm, hmm. <laughs> I stumped Not you. that I know of. I, 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 uh, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, uh, 
there's a lot of stuff out there about uh, therapeutic sound um, and frequencies, and a lot of various people have studied them. Um, but I, I, you know, I, it seems like it's it's very, you know, everybody. I think everything has like a resonant frequency because everything is in constant movement, and so um, while they can again, they, they can talk about like. Uh, maybe uh, the, the resonant frequencies of different body parts, or the resonant frequency of a particular human. Um, with all, they're all we're going to be different, and it's not going to be a static kind of thing. And I'm just speculating here, but it feels like it would. It's going to be more of a um, in the moment kind of sense, and what feels good to you, and what doesn't feel good to you. Um, there are some practitioners that you know sound. You, they 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 will sound and sound and sound and then suddenly you might feel a vibration a really intense vibration, and that could indicate that that's a, a particular uh, a sound that is is very helpful for you. I mean I've seen things like that. That's my experience, Aaron. The closest I could get there is that it has been very therapeutic on this project, um, but I don't know <laughs> of any any empirical links between sound and bodily microbiomes. Well, when you're done writing Hollywood soundtracks, maybe you could move on to music therapy, <laughs> music biotherapy. Yeah. So, um, yeah. we, we have another question um, that has to do with generative art. And I have to confess that as a scientist and, and not an artist, I had to Google generative art so I would know what I was asking about. And so for anyone else who is not familiar with the term generative art, I will share the definition I found, which is generative art refers to art that in whole or in part has been created with the autonomous non-human system. So essentially, rather than human creating the art, it's done through a system um, such as chemistry, biology, mechanics, robotics, mathematics. Um, so artificially created art, essentially, is my understanding of it. And so the question was, how has the generative art world changed in the last 10 years? And how would you rate the public's understanding of generative or data-driven art? Do either of you have any perspectives on that? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. Um, I, was, I wanted to uh, point towards uh, uh, Marcus Bueller at MIT. Uh, who uh, is actually using uh, artificial intelligence. He programs the DNA of proteins into the artificial intelligence, and the artificial intelligence sounds out new pot potential proteins. So that's like generative art and generative science kind of together in one thing. Um, very, very interesting work. And I think that uh, probably... The other the other thing about generative art that I that I'm aware of is things like um, there was one uh, sonification at Moogfest where they were they had a huge stream of data going just being funneled into a sound program and you get a, mostly what it sounds like like is like white noise and you get modulations in that noise but most people can't listen to that kind of thing and hear those kinds of modulations very readily I don't think. Um, so it, I don't, I think the, the public probably has a long way to, to come and being able to hear something that's generative in that kind of a way, but the kind of work that Marcus Bueller's doing is, is pretty accessible and, um, very interesting in that he's not only generating art, but he's also generating potential new proteins with what he's doing. I think that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it sounds like autonomously generated new proteins might be a good topic for one of those sci-fi thrillers that you're going to do the soundtrack of. Right. <laughs> and then you get the pun of translating. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have time for maybe a couple more questions. I'll try to fit them in. Um, one of them sounds like a good question for you to be thinking about when you decide to write a grant to bring in funding for this future, uh, for work <laughs> on this in the future. The question is, what um, are or were your partnership goals, and how have you measured success or progress to, towards those goals? And so I'll just restate that as, you know, what were you each hoping to get out of this collaboration when you started, and, and did you get there? 
or did you find things you didn't expect uh, along the way? That's a great question. So I think, uh, well, Jude, if it's okay, I'll, I'll lead off and then. You go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see. So the, the Global Sourdough Project was funded through an NSF grant uh, called Students Discover uh, in Rob Dunn's lab at NC State <laughs> University. And a big portion of that was to translate the science, uh, engaging the public to actually produce these huge scientific projects and data sets. Like I could never grow 571 sourdough starters. I fed 18 for a weekend and that was like a lot, right? <laughs> um, so, so engaging the public in the actual scientific process, whether that is folks at museums or folks at their homes and across generations or specifically in middle school, right? Um, and then as we got all of that scientific data in, we also were committed to returning those results to the public. So again, um, so I'm a teacher, you know, I, I'm an instructor at heart. I think about pedagogy all the time. How can I communicate my findings? Um, science doesn't do me any good if I just keep it to myself. It's for me, a lot of it is about the stories. So I think a lot about how to tell those stories visually to, to distill and, and make those complex relationships more intuitive. And I think uh, for me, this was an amazing opportunity to collaborate with someone who's very well practiced in thinking orally, right, musically about um, information, which is what data is at the end of the day. Jude, how about you? Well, I, I was very interested in, you know, learning more about the, you know, just the whole sourdough thing. I was also, I was, I had a, like a couple year old sourdough that I had been using and so it, it really piqued my interest. And so, and just, you know, learning more and trying to make more connections with uh, the way to sound out data. That was, that was my, I was just so interested in trying to do that and seeing if there's some way to make this uh, sounding, um, bring information to, to others from the scientists, scientific community. So I, to me, I, I was very happy that particularly when I shared my, the the lemur microbiome song with Erin and she was able to come back and say that's exactly what I found you know she was like oh okay so I was it was very it was just very exciting you know to know that that possibility is there to bring that uh, level of communication with the sound uh, to the science community. I think it was mutually affirming, right? Because you're yes. also telling yes, me absolutely. it stands up not just in pictures, but I can hear what I what I thought I did find, right? Yeah, right. I was going to say, Jude, you're on the phone, so you can't see this, but Erin has a, a huge smile and and she's nodding very, very enthusiastically <laughs> yeah. and agreeing with everything you're saying. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so one a question that's semi related to the previous one, and it's a very simple question, and I suspect I know the answer, but the question is, how have you funded your collaboration? Um, it's my sense that it's mostly been a labor of love so far and something that you've, have you had any funding for this or has it just been a thing you've done because it was a fun thing to do? Yes, for me, it's been definitely the labor of love for sure. But I think there may be potential with the sourdough, uh, you know, when I get a clearer sense of how I'm going to grapple with that data. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential for that one. Yeah. yeah. And we were able to offset um, the cost of like the lodging at the as if center for uh, the scientists in the group um, through use of the students discover funding um, because it was resulting in a product for public outreach and dissemination of, of our results. Um, but yeah, uh, we we had not foreseen that an, a collaboration of that sort might have been uh, something that would take shape. So we were we were lucky in, you know, the general wording of that grant. Yeah, definitely. That's great that, that worked out. Um, okay, a couple quick things. Um, one of our participants, Mark Olson, posted in chat that he, it's, he says shameless self-promotion. I'm fine with shameless self-promotion. Um, he <laughs> says to any Duke students in attendance, I'm teaching a course on generative art in the spring. Um, and he lists the course number there. So definitely check that out. I may have to check that out too now that I have read a Wikipedia entry on generative art and know all about it. Um, <laughs> we have a question submitted by Mike Nutt, who it looks like is someone you know, Aaron, and um, perhaps, no, he says, 
Um, question from my six-year-old who I told that Aaron is also a blacksmith. And the question from the six-year-old is, Aaron, what metal stuff do you make? Well, so I just reached around. I happen to have a snail at my <laughs> desk. So this is a snail that I made and it's got a curved bottom. So if you set it on a surface, you can actually make it wrap around. Um, that was a for fun thing, uh, for sure. I have a couple other snails that are like guarding our garden. So sometimes it's, it's um, fanciful, whimsical yard art, but uh, more often than not, it's, it's um, what utilitarian art, I guess. Uh, all the curtain rod holders and curtain gatherers in our house are blacksmith. Um, we've done, you know, toilet paper roll holders. Um, I'm trying to think of, oh, um, made a couple knives. Um, so, you know, it just kind of depends. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. I've made also some of those, um, what are they called? The, the triangles when you ring for dinner. Yeah. Um, so a few of those <laughs> before, yeah. So you ring those when you're calling people to come in and eat all the sourdough that you're- <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And occasionally, you know, uh, my partner and I'll make, you know, oh, it'd be really nice to just have something to feed a wire through just to keep it in a space. So then we'll just do a random spiral with mounting holes. Um, so it's, it's nice when you see a need for something semi-permanent, it's nice to know I can go to the junk pile and whip that up in 20 minutes or, or two days, depending on the scale. Wow. Well, and I think if you put those snails on Etsy, you could support all of your collaborations. In the future. I certainly would buy one. Right. It's really cool. So we are unfortunately out of time. Um, this has been fascinating and, and wonderful and, and enthralling. I want to thank you both so much for the cool work that you're doing and sharing with us. Um, and want to once again thank Ariana Ely, who um, wasn't able to be here today, but was the one who came up with this idea for this session and set this all up. Um, Ariana, I hope I did you justice by moderating um, even half as well as you would have. Um, I want to make a couple quick um, announcements, shameless self-promotion of my own. Um, a quick plug for next month's SciComm Lunch and Learn, um, which will be on Thursday, November 12th at noon Eastern time. And we'll be exploring the art and science of communicating science to the public through museums. Our um, presenter will be Dr. Holly Menninger of the Bell Museum in Minnesota. And her talk is titled, From Lab Rats to Leader, Communicating Science in the Museum Setting. So please go to the Duke Science and Society website and check out um, more information on that. And I just wanna share with everyone that um, I would love to hear from all of you with suggestions for future SciComm Lunch and Learn topics. So if there's an interesting aspect of science communication that you'd like to hear more about, or even something that you might wanna share with others, please send me an email. My email address is very simple. It's just my name, J-O-R-Y at duke.edu. That's jory at duke.edu. I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, and I would love to hear from all of you with suggestions for future SciComm Lunch and Learn topics. Um, with that, we are just about to one o'clock. So I want to once again thank um, our two guests today, Aaron McKinney and Jude Cassidy. And thank you all for attending and we will hope to see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.